Is a building just a shelter from the elements or do they mean something more? Are our spaces just containers for our activities or do they have the capacity to shape our souls and lift our gaze towards higher things? Why should a Catholic man understand architecture? Why should he care? Today, we will be joined by a professional architect, Rafael Morales, and we'll dive into all these topics and more. Stay with us. Hey everyone, really excited that you're here joining Sam and myself, John, on this podcast. We are excited to dive into the philosophy, the theory, the understanding of architecture. If this is your first time listening to us, know that we are on podcast players up the wazoo, whichever one you like to listen to, we're going to be on. We're also on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, please click that subscribe button so that you can get all of our videos. And finally, if this is your 10th time, or you've been a longtime fan of Catholic Gentleman, please go ahead and jump over to catholicgentleman.com slash Patreon, see the tiers that we have offered, and uh, discern supporting us. So diving right in, we've got Raphael here, really excited. I've known Raphael for a few years, been very blessed uh, to learn from him and to just engage in, in what it is that he does. But a little bit about Raphael before we dive into all the questions that uh, Sam and I have for this uh, professional architecture is that, uh, architect, is that Raphael was born in Mexico. He has a bachelor's of architecture in, from the University of Houston. He's a licensed architect here in the state of Texas. He is also specializes in church and school architecture. He's married with four kids, an amazing man, an amazing Catholic gentleman, and he also has his own podcast called Beauty Ever New. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about what he does, he's got, I think you're entering into your third season, um, a really great podcast, Beauty Ever New. So I guess just diving right in, I was a nerd and I put up my um, St. Patrick, uh, St. Peter's um, Square there in the back. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, so I got this little sketch of St. Peter's Square. Um, but apart from that, uh, architecture uh, is something that I've always admired, but never um, read a book about. So, you know, I'd love to uh, learn about all those things. What about you, Sam? Yeah, I've always uh, been fascinated by architecture myself. Um, I don't have an engineering bone in my body, but but uh, I just love the uh, marriage of form and function um, that architecture represents. And uh, just the ability to create an experience through a space. Um, I've been in some really incredible buildings that just take your breath away when you walk in. And, you know, yes, I'm speaking of uh, beautiful churches um, where you can be outside on a busy street, cars honking, you know, people shouldering past you, you know, in kind of New York City or one of these busy Chicago. And then you just walk into this place and it's like the world changes around you. Um, and that's an incredible experience. It's like you walked into another dimension or something. Um, and But I've also walked into some secular buildings that are also quite incredible. Um, I think of the uh, Calatrava Art Museum in Milwaukee, where I grew up in Milwaukee. And mm -hmm. um, I walked in there and like, wow, like just the beauty of like symmetry and like flowing lines. And yeah, uh, just kind of takes your breath away. And again, you're just kind of like, uh, surrounded by concrete sidewalks. And then all of a sudden you're just in this beautiful uh, flowing space uh, with light. And, and it's just, just like, again, going to go into another dimension. And it's, it's incredible what a building can do. Amen. So I'm, I'm excited for this. Yeah. So Raphael, I guess the first question, what got you into architecture? Well, that's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's start at the beginning. So I think that for me, you know, you mentioned I grew up in Mexico. And so 
uh, growing up in Mexico, it, in, in many ways, it's very different than, than the United States, especially in the way that it is planned and in the way that it is built. And I think what started it for me was really that there was, my family had this tradition that, you know, we would take vacations on a regular basis. And my dad was always interested in taking us to like the archeological sites of Mexico. So mm. we're talking, you know, the pyramids, right? The, yeah. you know, whether it was the Mayan pyramids or the Aztec pyramids, well, or the, you know, other civilizations that were uh, in Mexico, we made those trips from an early age. Wow. And those places leave an impression on you. This mm. idea that people thought it was so important to labor without modern technology and build these structures, you know, and that these structures had stood the test of time and then now here we were looking at them. So there was one element, you know, that really left a deep impression on me. And then couple that with the fact that Mexico is full of beautiful colonial churches, right? I mean, almost every town has yeah. a church at its center and pretty much every church is beautiful. You know, the, the part of Mexico that I'm from is Guanajuato, which is in the center of Mexico. And it is a particularly beautiful place because of the fact that it's in rolling hills. And so cities were built on these hills. And, you know, the structure of these cities are kind of the old medieval style, which is curving roads mm. that build up on each other. And so in the city of Guanajuato, as you're walking down the main street to get to the center of town, there is this really beautiful church. But what I love about it is as you're walking, you can't see the church because the, the street is curved. Mm. And so then as you're walking along, all of a sudden you turn the corner and boom, there's this amazing, beautiful church right in front of you. And like Sam was saying, it takes your breath away. I mean, it's just like so unexpected to see, you know, how the city plays off of each other to create these moments that leave lasting memories, you know. And so that's really what began, I would say, planting the seed inside of my mind of what was possible and what architecture meant, you know, and, and really seeing all these really beautiful churches and how towns were structured in Mexico, how the, you know, you had the town square and the church was right next to it. The center of life yeah. revolved around those two things. And almost every city to get anywhere, you have to go through the center of town. Mm. And so then you, you have this, the tradition that develops of making the sign of the cross every time you pass a church, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you do that several times a day if you're going anywhere. And so you see how architecture has the power not only to take your breath away, but to organize your life, to organize how you see things and how society itself is structured. Yeah, that's so cool. And I appreciate you mentioning that. I was struck by a time in my life when I was over in Cologne, Germany. And if any of the listeners have been there, when you get off the train station and you walk out, you see one of the biggest cathedrals ever built, you know, on this, on this God's good earth. And I remember in likening to what you said, Sam, it's one of the top five transcendental experiences of my life. When I saw that, I just was overwhelmed and I couldn't quite compute what I was looking at, it's so massive, but so beautiful and glorious that I remember having just to stop and the rest of the group I was with just kept on walking and I just stood there for a good five minutes in awe and have no clue what happened uh, around me, um, you know, from that time. So uh, just that ability of beauty to, to captivate us and to really grab the very essence of who we are, so. Just funny you mentioned that, John, because, um... We live uh, in a world where the only thing we know how to do is make things really big. <laughs> like, like, well, we can't build a beautiful building very easily anymore because we just don't have the uh, philosophical framework for that. So we're just going to make it really tall, like yeah. go for a mile or something, you know, like just, just as tall as we can possibly build it. Yeah. But it's amazing that in our world where we have huge skyscrapers, um, a medieval church built hundreds and hundreds of years ago can still take your breath away. And can you imagine what it would have done to a, you know, a medieval peasant who like was used to like a, no. a little hut or something. And yeah, then they just absolutely. like walk to the center of town and they see this massive yeah. fortress just coming out of the earth. And like, it just would have been incredible. That's your life. 
So Raphael, what, um, not only, so you, you had that experience of architecture, but then you decided to pursue it, right? So throughout mm-hmm. your life, um, where did that prayer come in, right? So I know that one of the tenants, and Sam, you speak incredibly beautifully on this, but of our latent qualities, you know, that God has has given within us to 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 create and co-produce and things like that and to be a catholic gentleman you don't have to be working on churches per se you know architecturally speaking in this context but there was something that happened with you and maybe it was churches that was like i want to start building those so when did that connection happen you know it's it's interesting Uh, this is something that I still think about to this day, just like, how did I get into churches? Because when I started architecture school and really when I was describing how my fascination fascination with architecture started, I, I loved the churches, but it, that's not necessarily where I began. I mean, I remember mm. going through school and just being really interested on how we make better cities. You know, how do we live better? Mm. And how do we make buildings that, you know, that really kind of care for the person and not just have the person be like a piece of furniture inside of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I began. And I went going through school, you know, and and having to think about different problems. One of them was urban planning. You know, how do you create a community that actually fosters togetherness and and, an actual community? So that was an interesting question. But as I went through school, if you look back, you begin to see that anywhere I could get a church in, I would. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. So even if it was a project that didn't necessarily require a chapel, I found a, a way to put a chapel in, you know. And again, at the time, I didn't, I didn't think twice about it. But what really, at the end of the day, focused me was the fact that I graduated in 2010. Okay. And this was right after the big crash. You know, this yeah. was right after um, just the, the crash of 2008. There was a job fair that happened every year at our school. And there was only two companies that came that year. Normally, wow. there's like 20 or 25. Wow. Both of them told me right away that they were not hiring. So that was a, that was a great, <laughs> uh, great way to start your career. And so I went, had good interviews, but obviously they didn't call me back. And so yeah. <laughs> I just was trying to figure out what to do next. But I got a call from the assistant dean at the University of Houston saying that there was a company here locally that was looking for someone that was that that could do church architecture. Mm. And it just so happened the reason he thought of me was that my senior thesis was to design what I called, you know, the new contemporary Catholic church. That was mm. my, my thesis. And uh, so he immediately thought of me and I went to that interview. It went great. And so I really felt like it was divine providence just saying wow. like all of that, all of those ideas that you uh, have been thinking about for these years, you can now put to, to work in this company. So That's how I got started. That actually leads me to a question. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I'm sorry, John, if you were going to say something. No, not at all. I want to hear uh, it. So I'm interested in kind of the future of Catholic architecture. Yeah. Because, um, you know, following the kind of the revolution culturally, not just in the church, but culturally, there was a emphasis um on kind of this minimalism this uh, even like brutalism where just just strip everything away and like it was very iconoclastic yeah. and um so then kind of the reaction to that in recent decades and it, i think it's amazing but we've kind of been throwing back to some of the baroque and neo-baroque and like even so in some cases like gothic or romanesque and like that's awesome that's like to me that's amazing that we're like rediscovering those roots however like at some point there has to be a transition to our own influence mm-hmm. or our own architecture if you will you know where we kind of move beyond the beautiful yes but um uh still kind of time bound architectures of the past and where so i'm interested you know knowing that that's your thesis i'm interested in your thoughts on like what does the contemporary Catholic church look like um, that doesn't look like a beige business center, but also, <laughs> you know, has some, has some beauty to it, but isn't necessarily a throwback to Baroque or Romanesque or something like that? Yeah. Well, that is a great question. And one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. And I would say one that is not fully answered yet. 
You know, mm. I think it's, it's going to be a career long pursuit, you know, but I do have a few things to say about it. <laughs> so I think that what we sense in the church, especially because of the last 40 years is that we lost something, right? Like mm. churches used to have a certain quality to them. They used to have what I think we would call a sense of the sacred. You would walk in and there would be no question that this is a church, that it is a sacred and holy space. Yeah, that's right. And, and just any person without a degree in anything would be able to recognize that sense of sacredness. And then somewhere along the line in that 40 year period, we have now come to a place where churches don't do that anymore. They're not inspiring. A lot of times they feel like any other building. You know, like, mm. am I in an airport terminal or am, am I at mass? You know, there, <laughs> there isn't a whole lot of, of difference, it seems. So the question is, how do you recapture uh, that sense of the sacred? But at the same time, take advantage of, first of all, modern innovations. You know, technology yeah. has progressed since they were building churches by hand, you know, stacking blocks on top of each other. Now you have steel, you have other things available to you. So how do you, how do you still keep that sense of the sacred, but move architecture forward? And what, what I think is really important, and I think the danger of just returning back to, you know, the traditional styles, if you will, the danger of it is you, you um, run the danger of losing the culture. You're no longer engaging mm. the culture with architecture that captivates everyone. Because at its best, Catholic architecture not only impressed Catholics, it impressed everybody. You know, it, it changed yeah. all of society. Oh, and so the mm. big danger that I think we run by simply going to the what is a safe haven, because it is, of traditional styles, mm -hmm. is that we won't be able to engage the culture in the way that we should. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, if, if I were to frame the, the kind of question and the task at hand, that's how I would frame it. Yeah. You know, the question is, what does that look like? Yeah, right? exactly. What yeah. Does Let's that take that next, to like? or what do you want it to look like? I'd like to hear that too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the closest thing we have um, that I think, and not everyone would agree and not everyone would also uh, you know, like what, what I have to say, but I think the closest thing we have is, is Gaudi is Antony Gaudi, Sagrada Familia, and his other, he did some other liturgical work. I mean, there's an example of a cathedral that is still under construction. It's not even a cathedral, it's actually just a church uh, that is under construction, that is incredibly innovative, way ahead of its time, that has captivated the attention and the, um, you know, just the, the interest of people from across the spectrum, not just Catholics. I mean, people travel to, to Barcelona to see it, even if, you know, they're atheists. And so yeah. that in a way is the closest thing we have to a Catholic architecture that is completely born out of prayer. Because if you read about Gaudí, and actually I just finished a, yeah. a biography of his, you read about him. I mean, he was a devout Catholic. He, mm. he not only saw that you should build churches in a Catholic way, he thought every building should be built in a Catholic way. Wow. If you look at his apartment buildings, his industrial buildings, there was always Catholic symbolism and overtones that once again were, were about shaping the person. And so I think as far as a contemporary example of a, a Catholic architecture, that would be Gaudi. But here's the thing, guys. Gaudi yeah. was early 1900s. So what, you know, so what's next? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, that's the challenge. That's the challenge is how do you build on that? One more thing I'll say. Yeah, please. This is really important. I think what people really miss out on is that in order to create a new Catholic architecture, it has to build on the patrimony of the church as it exists. Mm. You're not going to be able to create something out of mm. a vacuum because I think that if you do, that's how you end up with buildings that don't feel like a church. Mm -hmm. That's how you end up with airport terminals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to start from the really solid foundation of the Gothic styles and the Romanesque and everything else, and then evolve it naturally. You know, you have, um, you have Pope Benedict talk about the organic development of the liturgy. Yeah. Well, 
the architectural development of the church has to be the same. It has to be an organic development that happens naturally, that isn't forced, that isn't, you know, just stuck in there, but that really grows, you know, like a plant would. And so that's, that's where we're at. I mean, that's what we're trying to, to figure out right now is how do you begin to build on the really solid foundation that is the history of the Catholic Church? Yeah, I think that's exciting. And I'd like to ask you uh, for myself, but also for many of our listeners who've never really reflected on this. So I know exactly what you're saying. I used to go to a church in Minnesota when I was growing up uh, that the choir was like a part of the altar. And it was just kind of like there was no appropriate uh, symmetry. There was no appropriate divide between, you know, the sacred and what we were able to participate in. And so I'm curious, what would you say are the kind of fundamentals or the essence, you know, that should be maintained within Catholic architecture uh, that that shouldn't be lost or shouldn't be played with? If there is any, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. The short answer, there definitely is what I would say, a Catholic way of building a church. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that they all look the same doesn't mean there's one style that is favored over another. It just means, like you said, there are certain qualities that a Catholic church has that you should be able to recognize and that you should be able to identify whenever you go into a church. Mm-hmm. And so just to throw some out, I mean, yeah, I, I think that the first thing, and I think Sam actually mentioned it early on, was when you enter a church, you really should feel like you're entering a different world. And that's because you're entering heaven. You're entering truly, you know, a sign of heaven. A church is a sign of heaven. And so if when you enter a church, you don't feel like you're leaving the world behind and entering into a kind of a heavenly reality, then the church didn't do its job. You know, there's something lacking in that church. So I would say that's a quality that a Catholic church has to have. Um, The other is, and this begins to build on some of the traditional aspects. And the reason, for example, that churches tend to be long Mm-hmm. and they tend to be tall, is based on the fact that over time, there was a tradition that was developed in that those proportions created really beautiful spaces that, again, reinforced the idea that you were entering the heavenly Jerusalem. Because mm-hmm. that's another symbol of, of, of the church and also of the church building is the heavenly Jerusalem. So when you walk into a church and you see columns on the side of the church, what people need to begin to think about is, what do those columns represent? And in a lot of cases, those columns represent the 12 apostles. A lot of times you see, you know, depending on the size of the church, six columns on either side, but they represent the apostles as the foundation of the oh, church that, is the, that everything else is then built on. So a, a linear nave, a tall vertical space. Why vertical? Because that turns our eyes towards heaven. When you entered the Cologne Cathedral, that's yeah. probably what you did. You looked yeah. up. Absolutely. Your eyes are just, that's right. Your eyes are drawn up. They're drawn towards yeah. the heavens. And then a lot of times you see windows up high that then yeah. let light in. So what does all, all that remind us of? That reminds us of, our, of the heavenly reality that is awaiting us. Wow. So those are a couple of other qualities that you would see. What's, what, what else? You will see an altar, yeah. and that altar is substantial because the altar is a symbol for Christ. And so if Christ is a cornerstone and what everything is built on, it needs to be substantial. It needs to be identifiable. It needs to be solid. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. You can almost, you know, I was actually visiting a church up in Minnesota. It was yeah. a church built in the early 1900s. I don't know if you guys knew this, but like in the old way of building churches, there are certain rubrics you have to follow that unfortunately we have no no longer observed some of them. But one of them was that the altar itself had to bear on the ground. Like it couldn't, it couldn't uh, be a second floor and then have air underneath it. So this church has the parish hall in the first floor. So what they did is they built this giant column that connected the altar to the ground Wow. So they could, you know, meet that requirement. And you might think to yourself, like, why is that important? Why is it important to do that? 
And the answer is because when you go down there and you visually see that connection, you know what's happening. You know that the entire church is built on the altar and everything else around it is, is just, you know, kind of building up the centrality and importance of that altar. Oh, praise God. That's incredible. Yeah. I love that attention to detail. There's a lot of details where in a well-designed space, you're not necessarily consciously thinking yeah. about, but at the level of experience, you feel them. Um, and you can't necessarily put your finger on why do I feel like this space is different, but you feel it. Um, which is another kind of leads to my next question, kind of building off of what John asked, but just you know, your architectural toolbox of crafting a space um you know you have things like light um or sound even like is there an echo i don't know because sometimes when there's an echo people are hushed <laughs> just yeah. automatically um you know things like um the color of the surfaces and the materials and things like that so as you're thinking about like crafting a sacred space what are some of the things that go through your mind of the elements that you want to combine to create that sense of sacredness or otherness? Like this is not, this is not a business center. This is not an airport terminal. This is a, you've entered a heavenly realm here. Like what, what attributes uh, would you mix and match? Absolutely. Um, so there's an architect uh, that practiced in the early 1900s. His name was Ralph Adam Cram. And he was a big proponent of the Gothic revival at kind of okay. at the beginning, at the turn of the century. Honestly, if you want to learn about architecture, he's a good place to start. Oh, good. But in reality, the turn of the century kind of going from, you know, obviously beginning of, of 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, was an amazing time for architecture. Because I feel like that is when they were trying to take that next step that we're talking about of how do we use this new technology that we're beginning to experiment with steel and, and kind of more, more lightweight structures, but still create these really beautiful spaces. They hadn't yet lost the kind of sense of beauty. And so there's some really interesting architecture that comes out of that time period. And then unfortunately, the, the kind of modernist movement of the, what they called the machine age aesthetic took mm. over in which basically all ornament was removed. And so what happened is that really interesting train of thought that was starting in the beginning of the 1900s just stopped, just kind of ended. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, going back to the earlier question, part of what we need to do is recover that, uh, that, that train of thought and see where it takes us. But back to the question about materials. So he talks about Cram, you know, just talks about how ultimately the church, as it, as it was in a lot of medieval villages, was the pinnacle of all architecture in that town. And so, for example, he talks about how there was no need for the opera. There was yeah. no need for museums. You know, there was no need for gathering halls because the church was all of that. Mm -hmm. And so people would gather the best that they had to offer and bring it to the church. So an, another interesting thing he talks about is that a church is never finished. So you begin a church, you start the construction, but you're always adding on to it. You're mm. always trying to make it better and to bring the best that you have. So as far as materials, I would say that there should be a privilege given to natural materials. Mm. By natural materials was because God created the world yeah. and we are incarnational beings. Like, mm. he, like because of the incarnation of Christ, we are incarnate beings. We are sacramental beings that see the world through physical matter. Mm -hmm. And so seeing a church and being, having it be built out of natural materials, once again, shows us what potential this, these natural things that God gave us has. Yeah. And one way to think about it is that a stone does not meet its full potential until it's used for a church or a flower never reaches its full potential until it adorns an altar. Mm. So privileging natural materials reinforces the worldview that, you know, that God gave us, which is 
He gave us a creation and it is good. And it is there to show us God. You know, all of creation reveals God. And so the more we can use God's own creation and elevate it to the worship of God, the better and more beautiful a building will be. That just gave me chills because That's I realized powerful. in a moment why I find carpet so irritating in churches. <laughs> like, you know, you go to see marble floors versus like carpet. There's just something wrong there, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, definitely. And by the way, Sam, also, I want to mention this because it's an important point. What should a church sound like? You know? Yeah. I think that a church should be echoey. And why? Because there's something about the fact that when you walk into a really echoey church, well, I'll tell a quick story. Here in Houston, yeah. there is a chapel, the Chapel of St. Basil. And the Chapel of St. Basil is, was built by a modernist. And it, uh, you know, people have different opinions about it. I happen to like it, but I'll tell you why. <laughs> I like it because first, the quality of light is really great in there, like stellar. And it was probably yeah. by accident because he wasn't meaning to do that. <laughs> but they use this really thick marble on the floor. It's a very small space. It's a small university chapel. When you walk into that place, and I don't know if you've been there, John, but you open the door, and as soon as you take a step, that, whole, that step echoes in the entire room. Yes. I so what do you been. do? What do you do? You get really quiet. Yeah. Because you feel like every step is making a really big, big impact on the space. So in that sense, that really enhances the sense of the sacred because you know, it's kind of like the idea of this is hollowed ground. You know, like every step I take is like echoing in this, in this space. So that is a really effective thing about that chapel. And again, I'm not sure if they meant to do that, but the, the uh, effect that is also um, positive about it is when you hear Gregorian chant in that space, it sounds like you're in a big cathedral yeah. because of the way that the echo just works really well. So yeah, a church should have, should make you feel once again, through its various qualities, that this is hollowed ground. This is a church, you're entering uh, sacred space. You, you, you tapped on, you know, one of my loves, obviously as a musician. So as a professional trumpet player, the more echo in the church, the better, the more, yeah. the more joy filled it was. And for many reasons, right? So if you listen to, you know, Russian uh, Orthodox choirs, you know, and you can hear them, they stop singing and you hear the echo for 15 seconds afterwards, that's, right? That's right? All lifting up, the overtones are all starting to ring. And the, the beauty of that is there's not any one individual that stands out, but they can sing truly in union, um, you know, for their their songs lifted up to for the glory of God. And I remember you reminded me I was at St. Patrick's Cathedral in uh, not in New York, but the one in downtown Fort Worth, and the or the former organist that used to be the head there is an incredible organist. And every time we go there, there was there's a little aisle of of um, carpet. At least there used to be. It's been years since I've been there. And there was popcorn on the ceiling and it's a beautiful cathedral, but there's these popcorn <laughs> ceilings. And every single time we played, we just talked about what that's doing to the space <laughs> negatively and how that's affecting yeah. things negatively. And he was creating new risers in the choir loft just to try and combat some of these, wow. you know, rectoration, um, you know, things that had, had developed, um, over the years. Yeah. So I appreciate you mentioning that. And, 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 and the mass and the glory of the mass shouldn't be about any one individual. And I think that as musicians who understand that, it makes it all the more uh, enjoyable to play in a place like that. Because when I go to um, a new church that has that carpet, it's like, feels like every single note that I play is going to overcome and be heard by all. And it adds this you know, um, kind of like soloistic nature on the musician, which is very antithetical to, um, you know, what we should be working to achieve within the mass, so. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I would just add that, you know, a Catholic church has a certain sound to it as well. That's another quality of what makes a Catholic church is, you're supposed to be hearing the choirs of heaven when you go to church, right? Like when you go to a beautiful church that has a good music program, you almost feel like, again, you get the goosebumps going because it's beautiful. Like, yeah. you know, the, the way the sound carries, the way the sound echoes, all adds 
to this idea that the mass is is much more than just a gathering of people. It's the holy sacrifice of the mass, the you know the choirs of angels and saints singing with us in worship to God. I mean, that's when you go to church, you should not only think that, you should not only know that, you should hear that, you should see that, you should feel that. You know, and I think that when architecture is at its best, it does all of that. And you don't even necessarily like, again, consciously aware of it. It's just, you feel it. You just know. That's right. Um, yeah. I just have a quick question. I want to just switching gears just a little bit about kind of the philosophy that informs this. Because, um, you know, you look at like a medieval cathedral like Chart. Um, Mm -hmm. Just mind-blowing details, mathematical precision, and like everything means something. Nothing was random. I also have another fascinating book um, called uh, The Plan of St. Gaul. They found yeah. uh, um, it, the, the cathedral was never built, but it was architectural plans for a medieval cathedral. I think it was like in the 1200s or something like uh, 1000s. Wow. I don't know, long time ago, almost a thousand years ago. And, but everything was insanely meaningful. Like yeah. the, I can't remember the proportions, but they, the proportions were like uh, meant to reflect like um, the 40 days in the wilderness or something like that and culminating in like the sanctuary area or something like that. So like even like the width of the building and the length of the building all meant something, only the architects would know that. But still, like yeah. they didn't leave anything to chance. Nothing was random. You know, every rose window, everything was mathematically meaningful and significant. They saw meaning in every number. You know, mm -hmm. um, everything was just loaded with meaning because they saw a harmony in the whole cosmos and they were trying to reflect that. But what yeah. is like the modern um, philosophy of architecture? Like, where did it go wrong? Like, where do we go from that yeah, to go back to the head? Yeah, like Walmart, um, you know, <laughs> fluorescent lights and, you know, tile floors and like, you know, and just or even in our more, you know, artistic buildings, even where they're just this brutalist, like, you know, there's hallways that go nowhere and staircases that lead nowhere. And like, yeah. you know, just like a sheer celebration of ugliness. Like, how did we get to that <laughs> point? <laughs> it's not even a celebration. It's just ugly. No. <laughs> <laughs> absurdity it's absurdity um, it is yeah well so it's that's a, a very deep question but i'll do my <laughs> best to try to you know give a paint a picture of what may have happened so one thing i wanted to say because i think it's it's kind of funny but also true you know how aquinas said that grace builds builds on nature yeah well the medievals actually did that I mean, that's what they thought they were doing, and that's what they mm. intended to do when they built their cathedrals. They intended to perfect nature. You know, so nature brings it to a point, and then by their building the cathedrals, they perfect nature. So Aquinas' idea is more than just a, a theological or philosophical thing. It actually applies to the real cathedrals that were built in, in, the, wow. in the Middle Ages. Um, but where did we go wrong? Well, I think what happened, in, and honestly, you know, people will pinpoint different uh, times for this, but I'm going to start with the Enlightenment because that's when they began to circulate the idea that it was enough to hold something in your mind and that what happened outside of it was almost irrelevant. You know? mm. and, and so I'm going to put this in architectural terms. You know how people, I'm sure you've heard this because I've heard it many times. Why did they have stained glass windows in the Gothic cathedrals? And what do people say? Well, because everyone was illiterate and therefore they needed these, these windows so that they could know a little bit of what was going like on. Bible stories, yeah. Right? That's what people say. Okay, well, if you accept that as true, then as the population becomes more literate, you don't need stained glass windows anymore, right? You don't need carvings. You don't need uh, beautiful murals because you know how to read. If that's all you need, then we can begin to strip away some of these things. So there was, that's one kind of stream of thought that you can see how the idea that your mind was enough for you to educate yourself, mm. that you could then begin to make arguments for removing 
all of all what you would you might call instructional uh, you know decoration. So that's one stream of thought. The other was that as the industrial revolution develops, you have the notion that architecture should reflect this change in society. Mm. So we see society becoming more and more mechanized, more and more based on the industrial machine, right? And so you have architects um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, beginning to explore the idea that architecture should reflect what I, I mentioned earlier, the machine age aesthetic. Mm. And so they begin to look at um, ocean liners, they begin to look at automobiles, airplanes as the inspiration for buildings. Mm. And they begin to conceive of buildings, not as these places where you have deep memory and where you worship and live life. But instead, you have an architect by the name of Le Corbusier, who's a French architect, very influential in the modernist movement. He calls a house a machine for living in. Mm. Well, think mm. about what, how that changes your conception of, of a building. If a, if a house is a yeah. machine for living in, then yeah, it's streamlined. You remove all decoration. It's, it reflects the machine age aesthetic. So it's made out of steel and glass. You do have some innovations that are developed in that time period. Like for example, you know, uh, for, for most of history, the way buildings were built, load-bearing masonry, you stack stones on top of each other and then you put a roof on it. For the first time, steel and concrete allow you to have the structure be completely separate from the walls. Mm. And so that opens up, again, the ability to have churches that are made out of all glass, you know, or mostly glass. You have also just, they fall in love with the idea of concrete. So you see a lot of concrete, again, reinforcing the machine age aesthetic. So add on to that, the world, especially, you know, after the world wars, begins to take on a kind of international uh, outlook, right? Where the, the whole world's trying to come together after these horrific wars. And some of them saw traditional architecture as almost being part of the culprit of what happened, that representing the past. How do we start fresh, start anew? And so you have the development of something called the international style, hmm. which the idea being all buildings will look the same across the world. So now regional differences, regional materials, what made architecture interesting and human begins to be stripped away in favor of these grand ideas. Oh, wow. Going back to Le Corbusier for a minute, his idea of a city, just to give you a, you know, kind of an idea, was uh, he wanted to level Paris, completely demolish it, and put back in its place um, just a series of really tall towers that are spaced miles apart with just gardens in between, just like forest in between, and you would get around exclusively by automobile. And so that was like the conception of a future city that these guys were pushing. Wow. So that's what lays the foundation for what happens next. You have you know, some capitalist forces at work, some people that are just trying to, you know, make money, nothing wrong with that. But they see in the, in the, in the modernist thought, uh, hey, look, we can just build boxes and people will buy it. <laughs> you know? And so and that proliferates. That's right. And ultimately, what I would say, and, and I'll, I'll say this as a way to kind of maybe, you know, uh, start a rally cry here. Yeah. It happened because we allowed it to happen. You know, we, we, we chose to purchase this architecture. Architecture doesn't just pop up on its own. People have to purchase it. They have to be willing to do a building in a certain style in a certain way. But just to kind of answer your question, that is the foundation that, that, is a, that allows churches to look like, you know, mm -hmm. barns. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it all just moves forward into the rest of our lives. Yeah, you brought up that um, capitalist mentality, which is uh, profit first, and what can be most efficient, what can be quickest. Mm -hmm. And, and so I had another thought, but your last comment right there, very provocative of, we let it happen. 
how do we as a culture or we as an individual or me even as a father move in this direction in, the, in an appropriate direction of appreciation for architecture for my family and for our society? What What thoughts, because I think like myself, I wouldn't even know quite where to begin. Okay, so buy an older house, you know, or only shop in, you know, a building that was built 100 years ago? No, that's not going to work. So how do we, um, how do we start building up this culture of understanding uh, beauty in the architecture and how it can uh, better our lives and, and better humanity? Great question. So I think the way that we do it is the same way that we approach other cultural and, and you know just important milestones in our life. So for example, we, I'm sure the three of us, we try our best to try to curate the books our, our kids read, right? We yeah. try to introduce to them beautiful books, um, books that we know are gonna be uplifting, that form them in the right way. Um, we do the same probably with music, especially you, John, I'm sure you yeah. are particular about what kind of music you know, right. you kind of expose your kids to. So there's already a built-in desire to pass on beauty to our kids mm -hmm. and for them to be able to recognize it. Like that's an important thing that I think as parents and as fathers, we try our best uh, to do that. So building on that, what I would say is the way you begin to turn the tide is we need to become tastemakers again. We have to set what what the standard is, you know, like if we seed the ground and we say like, oh, look, we'll just keep building, you know, the same churches that we like over and over again and not engaging the culture and not going out and, and saying like, you know, this kind of building, this way of building is not just good for us as Catholics. It's good for everyone. It's, it's a human way of building, not just, yeah. you know, a, a machine way of building. So if we begin to think of it as a, you know, going back to Cram, he talks about how architecture is a symptom of the health of a society. And so if we look at our society, our society today, you can begin to see many of the ills of society are represented in its architecture. If you want to change that architecture, we need to also change society. And so I think that many of the efforts that we already put in as fathers of trying to educate our children begin to turn the tide on architecture mm -hmm. naturally. But how do we do it in a more pointed way? Mm -hmm. Well, the way I, what I would say is do what my dad did, you know, take us on vacations, show us what a beautiful building looks like. Mm -hmm. you know, like show your kids, look, here's a beautiful cathedral. Let's experience it. And, and, and again, I think, you know, Sam was, was hitting on a, on a point that I think is really important. It doesn't even need to be overt. You don't need to sit there and explain to them why this building is beautiful. We are built that way. You know, when you walk into a beautiful church, you don't need a thesis paper explaining why it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, I think that's why ultimately the modernist style will fail is because most of the time those modernist buildings do require you to read a really long thesis to, to understand why in the world they would build something like that. Yeah, but it's a beautiful math church, experiment. Mm -hmm. That's right. A beautiful church needs no explanation. So I would say just take your kids to beautiful buildings. When you go on vacation, pick a beautiful building, you know, like go, look through the city where you're going and identify maybe a couple of buildings where you can visit and go see them, you know, like yeah. begin to cultivate in your kids an awareness of what is a beautiful building and an awareness of what is not, because yeah. that's important as well. Awesome. No, I think that's a great reminder and a great point for each of us fathers when we're taking our kids out to be intentional mm -hmm. about that, not just letting it happen, but but making it a, um, a kind of a point or a centerpiece of of our um, experience with our families. And I think that's that's great. My mind's just going in many different directions. So I appreciate that. I'll add one more thing. Yeah. Just. So that, you know, people who may not be familiar with the way that the, you know, just the building process works. So there's three ingredients to a good building, right. to a beautiful building. So you, yes, you have to have a good architect, no question, right? You have to have a good architect. Second, you have to have a good builder, 
and a, and a proportional budget, a budget that could, would cover the cost of, of the building. But third, you have to have a good client. And I think sometimes people don't realize how important that is. You don't get a great building unless you have all three ingredients. So what I would challenge everyone is, you may not directly be part of a building process, but a lot of times, especially in our parishes, there's committees that are formed that make the decisions on what churches will look like. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to, you know, you need to cultivate your knowledge of architecture and of beauty, and then go get on that committee. That's right. Because those committees really do make choices. So how do we turn the tide is we have to begin to participate in the architectural conversation of our parishes, and then eventually of our society, of our culture. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. I actually have one last question, because um, it's not every day I get to talk to an ar architect. <laughs> um, but I love what you're saying about like starting with the churches, yes, but also kind of radiating out from that to society at large and kind of recovering this human way of building. So I want to talk about just a second about secular buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, is there something wrong with me? Because I love a Gothic cathedral, but I also love Frank Lloyd Wright. And even some like modernists like Zaha Hadid, you know, where yeah. they're just these flowing lines and glass and light. And it's all just like, whoa, you know, yeah. um, but is there something wrong with me? Like for appreciating both, is there also a sense in which there is a place for, you know, with like you mentioned multiple times, these new materials that we have that maybe didn't mm. exist before and we can, do things with flowing lines and shapes and uh, even glass, cut glass, you know, that we weren't able to do before. Um, is there a place for that in your, in your kind of conception of architecture? Um, and also like uh, kind of thinking outside the church for a minute, like what might a more human architecture look like in a city or in an office building or, or in these places that aren't necessarily sacred, but they still are places that we live in every day. So I guess right. that's kind of a twofold question, but. No, that's a great question. Is there something wrong with you? I don't think so, because there would be something wrong with me too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, clearly I think there are, you can point to many examples of where there, you know, there was something truly remarkably remarkable achieved by what you would call a modern architect. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, like you mentioned the, the museum in Milwaukee, uh, you mentioned Saha Hadid, who's obviously, she was one of the most innovative yeah. architects, I think, of, of recent of recent time. So clearly, like, there are many places where you go and, and it is really, um, maybe not quite take your breath away like a church would, but you're inspired by it. I mean, it is the way light enters the space and the way that they use materials. Yeah. And so, so, I mean, I think that there there is definitely a place for it. Um, I think that you know muse you see museums a lot of times being a perfect place for kind of a more experimental architecture that you know doesn't uh, necessarily adhere to more traditional ways of building. But when it comes to the city, I I think that we have to be more more intentional about how we do it, and we have to do it in a way that really focus on focuses on the human person. And I would even add that focuses on the dignity of the human person that comes from God. Mm. Because I think that's what's been missing. I think that our, our world would claim to be very concerned with humanism, you know, like humanist yeah, ideas. For sure. The problem is their conception of human doesn't necessarily carry the idea that we were made in the image and likeness of God. I think yeah. that's an ingredient that is missing. Yeah. So we look at our cities crisscrossed by giant highways that, yes, get us around, but look how it divides the city. Look how sometimes on one side of the city, it's a very bad part of town. And on the other and the other side of the highway, excuse me, it's a very nice part of town. So that sometimes the way that we conceived of our cities as being very dominated by the automobile has caused, you know, pretty bad effects as far as community building and as far as just the human scale of the city. And so... While I would say there is definitely um, places for 
like let's say the Frank Gehrys of the world. I don't know yeah. if people know Frank Gehry, yeah. but you know he does the titanium steel wavy buildings. You know, like he did the Walt Disney Concert Hall. I think yeah. that's a perfect place for that kind of architecture. You know, for it's sure. kind of wavy and it kind of reflects it. But it definitely wouldn't be that if you took that and tried to make a church with it, mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't fit. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, if you try to make a house with it, I don't think it would fit. You know, like you need something that feels more human scale that where you can see the order that it has to it. You know, like Aquinas would talk about how something is beautiful when you're able to see like it's, it's meaning, you know, when you're able to discern the meaning of that object. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's important for a house to look like a house, you know, for a church to look like a church. But again, I do think there is place for experimentation. I would say, you know, in museums, especially, or concert halls, things like that, that don't necessarily have these human scale requirements like a house does or a church does. Yeah, that's great. Well, so I could just, we could just keep on talking. I think we're coming up in an hour here, but uh, praise God. So Raphael, I know one way that people, I imagine a good majority of, of listeners um, don't have a solid knowledge of architecture. They probably can't tell you that St. Peter's is, you know, Baroque, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and its structure. One way that they could, I know one way they could better understand these things is go to your podcast, Beauty Ever New. And I'll put that in the description. I'll put that in the show notes so that people can click over there. But what else can Catholic gentlemen do to better appreciate, better understand, and therefore better appreciate um, architecture? What I would say is number one way is just go visit buildings. I mean, even, even for me, like people ask me, how, do, how can I become a better designer? Just go visit buildings. Like there's something, yeah. there's something about just seeing space that yeah. changes the mind, that really shapes and forms you. Um, so there's nothing better than that. I would yeah. say more than looking at books, more than looking at pictures on the internet, just go look at beautiful buildings around you or in places you visit. I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. Awesome. Outside of that, I'm going to throw out a few names that if good. you can kind of study up on, I think you'll get a good glimpse at architecture. So I will, I will give uh, three architect names and then three buildings that maybe people should look at uh, for, you know, for a good kind of just general knowledge about architecture. So starting with the architects, I think I, me I mentioned some of them already, but um, Anthony Gaudi, mm -hmm. he's a Catholic architect. In fact, I think his cause for canonization was uh, was open. So you should know as a Catholic gentleman about Gaudi. Yeah. In fact, I would recommend the, the biography. But the other I also mentioned is Ralph Adams Cram. So he, again, was a turn of the century Gothic revivalist architect. I think he had very important ideas about how we should think about architecture. And let's see, the third I would say is Brunelleschi going a little mm. bit back in time to the Renaissance era. So Brunelleschi, yeah. fascinating character. He is best known for building the Duomo in the cathedral yeah. of Florence. And the interesting thing about him is it was the first time since antiquity that they had built anything remotely that big as far as a dome. And so he had to literally invent the technology to make it work. And so he's a fascinating wow. character also uh, you know, Renaissance man was a sculptor, a mathematician. He also developed, you know, concept of perspective that is used in art even to this day. So there's a really good biography on him called Brunelleschi's Dome, which is just a fascinating story about how he built the dome. So that would be a, a recommendation. Definitely get to know Brunelleschi. Awesome. As far as buildings, just throw them out real quick. You should know what the Pantheon is in Rome. Uh -huh. You should know Notre Dame yeah. and Sam, I, I would throw Chartres as well, Chartres Cathedral yeah. in, in France as well as premier examples of Gothic architecture. I would say San Giorgio Maggiore for uh, Renaissance era yeah. architecture. And then Sagrada Familia by Gaudi as a more contemporary, um, contemporary example of what a church is. So. Amazing.
I'll put all of those in the show notes as well. So I know a lot of listeners jotting things down uh, like I want to do, but I'll put them in the the notes so you can go there and and click on those and probably bounce off to Amazon and purchase. And so, uh, Raphael, what an amazing time we could keep on talking. I'm so grateful for you being here. So thank you so much. Um, yeah. It, anything else you want to share with the listeners? One more thing. One more yeah. thing. So I want to take us back to the era before COVID. <laughs> yeah. Seems so long ago. So April 15, 2019. And what happened on April 15, 2019 was the Notre Dame fire. Yeah. And I, I mean, I remember it very clearly because I've never been to Notre Dame. And so I felt this sense of loss that I was never going to get to see it as it was, you know, and I think that a lot of people felt that sense of loss. And it was amazing to see how a building, which is I mean, an inanimate object, was causing such, such a panic across the world. How many people cared about this building? And why did they care? It wasn't just because it was history or because, you know, it had been built a long time ago by these people or because it was yeah. innovative at the time. It's because of what it represented. It represented civilization. It represented France. It represented, you know, the best that the Catholic Church has to offer. And people were seeing it crumbling before their eyes. Mm. So what I would, the challenge for all of us, you know, me as, me as a designer, but everyone else as, as you know, as uh, clients and as committee members, hopefully in the future, is how do we build more buildings like that? That if we were to lose them, we would mourn over them because of how much it means to us and because of how much is built up in it. You know, think about this. For, you know, these cathedrals, for 500 years, people got up in the morning and worked on them nonstop. Can you imagine us doing anything for 500 years? So there's something there, you know, there, there's something about that building. And that's what we're trying to recapture. That's what we're trying to, you know, build up in our, in our societies and, and, and with our children, with our work. We're trying to build up buildings that people will just love and that will represent everything that is best in humanity. Oh, praise God. Chills. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank Love you. It. Yeah. Thanks for your sharing with us, your intellect, your, uh, your passion, you know, uh, and your, and your expertise, you know, I'm my pleasure. My I'm pleasure. grateful. So Sam, as we end every episode with the reminder to all of our, uh, Catholic gentlemen watching, be a man, be a saint. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>